Uh, welcome to the North Carolina Museum of Arts virtual lunchtime lecture, Playing with Danger, the Mesoamerican Ball Game. My name is Maria Lopez and I am the manager of film and lecture programs. Thank you for spending uh, your lunch hour on this uh, rainy day here in North Carolina with us today. Um, we deeply appreciate your continued support of our virtual programming. Uh, before we begin with the program, I'd like to give everyone an overview for today's lecture. Our lecturers today will present and then we will have a short Q&A session after their presentation. Uh, please enter any questions using the Q&A function or the chat box. You can specify if it's for a specific presenter or if it's for both. Uh, we would also like to let you know that this lecture will be recorded and made available on the NCMA YouTube page. We will also be sharing the link to the recording with you via email. I'd like to introduce our guests today, NCMA curator Angel Gonzalez Lopez and Andrew D. Turner, Senior Research Special Specialist at the Getty Research Institute. Angel Gonzalez Lopez uh, got his PhD at the University of California, Riverside. He's a research curator of ancient American art at the North Carolina Museum of Art. Uh, the primary focus of his research is on iconography analyses of late post-classic art in central Mexico, 1200 to 1519. He founded the Aztec Stone Sculpture from the Basin of Mexico project to create a standardized database of stone sculptures currently found in various educational institutions in the United States, Mexico, and Europe to facilitate comparative analysis. He is the author of Imágenes Sagradas, Iconografía en Esculturas de Piedra del Recinto Sagrado de Tenochtitlán y el Museo Etnográfico, uh, published in 2015. González López was previously a junior fellow at the Dumbarton Oaks Research Library and a full-time excavation specialist with the Proyecto Templo Mayor for 10 years before beginning his graduate studies. Our second speaker is Andrew D. Turner, who also got his PhD at the University of California, Riverside. He's a senior research specialist uh, at the Getty Research Institute. The primary focus of his research is on art identity and cross-cultural interaction in central Mexico during the epiclassic period, 600 to 900. And he has also written articles on the art of Teotihuacan, the Mexica, the ancient Maya, the Olmec, the Moche, and uh, colonial Andes. Turner's recent publications include book chapters entitled Unmasking Tlaloc, the Icon Iconography, Symbolism, and Ideological Development of the Teotihuacan Rain God, and, uh, which was published in 2020, and The Murals of Cacaxla, uh, Monumental Art as Evidence of Migration, published in 2019. And he is co-editor of the forthcoming book, Flower Worlds, Religion, Aesthetics, and Ideology in Mesoamerica and the American Southwest. Turner is currently engaged in an extensive project that traces the looting and collection of pre-Hispanic antiquities from uh, Mexico. Prior to joining the Getty, he held, he held positions at the Yale University Art Gallery and at the University of Cambridge in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research. Welcome, Angel and Andrew. Thank you so much, Maria, and hello, everyone. Thank you so much for your lunchtime um, uh, time. And so just uh, at the beginning, let me explain the dynamic for this presentation. I'm going to present uh, a PowerPoint that Maria is going to start right now. and to provide this uh, a sense of uh, the ball game, the pre-contact game in the pandemic time. Uh, we decided that to create this uh, bouncing between Andrew and I. So the first uh, turn is, uh, it's my turn. So later I'm gonna explain some topics and introduction later is, uh, is Andrew's time and so and so. But uh, let's begin with some basic terms. Uh, space and time. We are gonna focus in this cultural area that is uh, called 
Mesoamerica, and uh, as etymologically, it's an etymological term that describes a cultural area that encompasses several countries and almost 3,000 years of history. So we are uh, now in part of Mexico, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, and El Salvador, where in ancient times, this area was inhabited by several cultures and societies for almost, uh, as I mentioned, 3,000 years. And it, it today continue certain customs and cultures, languages, food. But first, uh, we are gonna give an overview for the and very specific uh, game that was all, almost always present in, in this area. So, but we're gonna pick some uh, cultures and societies. So we are gonna speak, um, we're, we wanna touch Maya society, uh, Aztec, um, Totonac, uh, Mystic, and so on so. But after that, uh, next slide. Let me uh, explain you why is this uh, is important. The ball game had many levels of meanings and could be played for many reasons, from sand lot uh, sport to court ritual. Many Mesoamerican uh, people saw in the ball game a metaphor for the movements, uh, movements of the heaven, heavenly bodies, particularly the sun and the moon, but there are others like Venus. The ball itself may have been understood as the sun journey in the uh, journey in, in and out the underworld. It has been interpreted as a rite that symbolized war, served to public reenactment incorporated human sacrifice, hunting, uh, the struggle of days against the night, while the court on which the game took place was a, uh, a portal between the earthly world and the upper world, a liminal site of death and birth, a cave uh, for both exiting and entering. The game becomes a metaphor of life, death, but most important for regenerations. In some instances, victorious ball players were decapitated, they defeated once, school racks for the trophies often at joint ball courts. But let's start with the first civilization in Mesoamerican times, the Olmec. Uh, and the ball, that, that's one of the main features for this game. In 1939, Charles Goodyear discovered the chemical processes, process that later will be known like vulcanization. He mixed rubber with sulfur, and form a resistant and hard mass. All uh, Olmeca people use a simil similar uh, process to create rubber balls to be used at the ball game ceremonies more than 3,500 3, years ago. But uh, for this reason, I'm showing you this slide because in 1989, during the archeological salvage project at El Manati, in Veracruz, the Gulf Coast of Mexico, look uh, in Hidalgo Titlan um, municipality, archaeologists uh, Ponciano Ortiz Ceballos and Maria del Carmen Rodriguez discovered many of these uh, rubber balls in the archaeological context associated with access offerings, as you can see in the slide, the upper right. Some of these is, uh, access are made of Jedi, this green stone. Uh, stone. After years of uh, investigation and several studies, it was established that Olmeca people mix uh, latex um, rubber of the tree, the, of the rubber tree, whose scientific name is uh, Castillo Elastica. Next, please. Uh, they were mixed this uh, resin from the tree, uh, the, the rubber tree with sulfur, but mixing with, uh, with the substance present in, in the flower on, 
present on, on your right side of the slide. This, is, this plant is called in the, the scientific name, Ipomea alvea, a perennial herbaceous plant, which contains latex with sulfites. Sulfur contained in Ipomea produces a chemical reaction that allows vulcanization. Sulfur atoms inter, uh, interlace to, with the, the rubber chains turning out the latex into a resistant and hard material that you can manipulate and to create balls. Uh, next, please. But Mesoamerica people uh, process rubber by cutting an incision on the tree to obtain the sap, which is a milky and sticky liquid in its nature state. When dried, it's a very fragile and doesn't uh, not manage to retain form. But after that, uh, let me explain the general uh, layout for the, the game. One important building, pivotal uh, building in, in this game was the, the court. The ball game's huge cultural importance among Mesoamerican times is attested through the archaeological remains through carved or painted scenes, through terracotta figurines, and through hieroglyphic texts. All over pre-contact Mexico and Central America, uh, for some three millennia, games were played with rubber ball, and in parts of Northwestern Mexico, an indigenous ball game is still played, like Michoacán, Nayarit, Jalisco, that part of Mexico. In, Architectural terms, the ball court is defined as an alley court or rectangular track with flat earthen floor, which could be plastered or covered with stones. Its limits were defined by two or more or less parallel structures with slope walls, sometimes with clearly defined zones that gave the entire area at the shape of uh, a capital letter I. So you are seeing here a artistic reconstruction by the Mayanist uh, Tatania Poroskuriakov, the ball court of uh, Piedras Negras in Guatemala. Rounds ball courts markers in alleys that later I'm going to explain, of course, frequently bear a quarterfold cartouche indicating an opening to the underworld. Points were scored by striking as the solid rubber ball uh, aiming, aiming it towards a ring or marker set along the alley, alleys or in the end zones. The rules varied, but the game was played between two teams. That's a general term. Composed of two or three teams members. We don't know if um, men uh, exclusively play this game or women also can uh, play too. But there are some depictions in, in Jokchilan or in codices that represents women. The rules varied, but the game, uh, as I mentioned, was played between two teams, composed uh, of two or three teams members each, giving a total of uh, four or six players, the most widespread version of the game. The players control the ball by hitting it with the upper arms and tie touching it with the hands was completely forbidden, except to put the ball into play. Um, one of the people, uh, next please. One of the people um, features defining Mesoamerican civilization is the ball game. So we are gonna find only exclusively in this area. However, the origins and change through time remains for better understanding or knowledge indicates that the earliest ball court dates 1650 BC from Paso de la Mada, from the Chiapas Lowland. And the presence of 2,300 probably ball courts in these regions indicates the ball game is of great importance to ancient Mesoamerica. So you are seeing in, in this slide, um, depictions from pre-contact books and colonial books too, depicting ball players uh, in, in, in the alley, in the building. But 
we have to remember that this logic in this part of the world at this time is kind of quite different for these societies and cultures. They can, these people can interact with different uh, human beings, uh, ancestors, deities, but also with other animals like in your uh, right uh, uh, upper um, part of the slide, a ball game player is, is, is playing with a lizard. No, it's kind of um, can, can be problematic for our, our logic, but for that time it's kind of like, and there weren't any problems. But also where this building was the place to gathering together with uh, ancestors, with rulers, with the population in general. Next, please. So for the um, collection, the ancient American collection, we have several of these pieces that uh, can tell us about this behavior in the past. On your right, we have a beautiful ball game marker, probably from Chiapas. It's a beautiful uh, carving depicting uh, probably one of the uh, hero twins in, from the Maya mythology. But inside uh, um, this kind of U-shaped form, it's, it's the glyph for the moon. So the scene is, is happening inside the moon. This is, a, is depicting um, other realms. But also in your left side, you have uh, um, a greenstone joke. This is a part of the attires for the ball game players that Andrew's gonna explain in much better than me. And next, please. So this is my last slide for this time, but I love this scene. This is a, a rollout from the Justin Kerr collection. This is a uh, base, a cylinder, but Justin Kerr developed this technique to unroll the cylinder and to create a two-dimension scene. So we were are seeing what is happening in this beautiful depicted scene, it's very colorful. That is, it's kind of familiar for us because the ball game players uh, are in action, no? This is a juxtaposition of different scenes, but on, on the back, you can see the people, the audience screaming and chatting, probably eating, but it, it gave this scene, gave us a snapshot of what, what really happened in the past. Now you can see these five figures in the, the first plane, they were the, the ball game players, no, but they were screaming like when we are watching football. It's very common to to hear these these gestures. I think I'm gonna leave and give the microphone to Andrew. Okay, thanks a lot. It's a uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, and always a, a pleasure to work with Angel on different projects. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, the gear and equipment that is uh, shown worn by Mesoamerican ball players. In uh, these two images, what you see here are um, a, a Maya terracotta figurine wearing this really gigantic hip uh, padding that extends over the stomach and down over the hips, and uh, and and then in, in another scene, another rollout scene of a of a Maya vessel similar to the one Angel just showed two uh, Maya players playing the game, both also wearing these giant uh, protectors that are almost uh, comically large. And you, you'd sort of wonder how um, they would be able to play um, in, a, in a game that required a lot of fast movement. And, and they, they almost sort of recall on some level in my mind, the, the um, dancing hippopotamus and, and Fantasia. Uh, and then on, on top of that, they wear these really large elaborate headdresses. But what this tells you is, is that there's a sort of an element of uh, public display and theatricality that goes along with the ball game. And you'd have to wonder if, if uh, Maya rulers portray themselves wearing these giant uh, costumes in order to sort of like, sort of um, heighten the sense that they're able to sort of move with skill and ease despite wearing these really cumbersome outfits. 
And then the ball itself in, in the, the, the vase scene is uh, very faint. It's, it's way uh, out of proportion compared to the players. And you can very faintly see in the center that there's a glyphic inscription on the ball itself. Uh, on the left, uh, there is a, a number that looks to me like the number seven or eight. And then it's got a, a, um, a hieroglyph that says knob, which uh, the epigrapher Mark Zender has translated as meaning hand span. So uh, if we take those two signs together, we have a ball that, that is um, seven hand spans big. I don't know if that's diameter or circumference of the ball, but at either rate, it's, it's a pretty good sized ball that's, that's measured by the width of, of seven hands. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so these are not Maya objects per se, but um, ba basically there's a lot, uh, we, we don't really have um, probably what, what most players wore was perishable and that type of equipment doesn't survive. But we do have these stone objects that we know to associate closely with the ball game because they appear in certain scenes of, of people playing the game and, and doing associated sacrifices. And there's roughly three classes of, of these objects. One is an acha, which um, the name means axe in Spanish because early investigators thought that they were axe blades, but in fact, they are um, not axe blades. They're part of the ballgame equipment, and they're usually in the shape of a head and, and carved thin. Uh, so in, in, um, if you were looking at that acha straight on, it would be kind of like a, a very thin piece about the width of an adult's hand or maybe a little wider. Um, similar to the acha is a palma, which is this uh, long, thin, uh, um, sculpted, um, piece usually with sort of a concave base on the bottom. And then the other piece that we associate with the ball game is called a yoke, like the, like the example from the North Carolina Museum of Arts collection that Angel showed earlier. Um, and these, are, these, these objects are invariably made of stone. Next slide, please. So uh, the, these types of objects, there aren't really that many of them that have been excavated um, compared to the amount that are actually in, in private collections and in museums. So there's been a lot of looting and um, most of them seem to come from the Gulf Coast of, uh, of Mexico, like the state of Veracruz and Tabasco. And then a lot of them also come from the southern coast, the Pacific coast of Guatemala. And most of them date to a period uh, of about uh, AD 600 to 900. And if you look at this chart here, uh, which shows different types of ball courts, um, not only is this uh, late classic period, the time when, um, when all this stone ball game equipment shows up, but it's also the time when all this variety of different types of courts show up as well. And the, the numbers of courts at different sites kind of, uh, kind of explode as well. So by the late classic period, virtually every self-respecting Mesoamerican city had at least one ball court and many of them had multiples, um, sometimes five or six. Um, the city of El Tajin in the state of Veracruz has uh, 18 ball courts. And there's a city in uh, Puebla, the state of Puebla called Cantona that has 24 ball courts. So um, we don't really know why they would need so many ball courts, but you'd almost be tempted to suggest that these were like regional centers for the game or something like that. But, but at either rate, this, this seems to be sort of like the major proliferation of, of um, both ball courts and this, this kind of stone ball game equipment that we see as well. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is, a, this is a, a rather typical stone yoke. It's um, what, what we think it is, is basically a stone representation of the, the, the padding that would have gone around a player's waist. And most often, although not always, they're carved in the form of a stylized toad, like, like this one. So um, toads are kind of broadly associated with water and the earth, but we can't really say a whole lot more uh, other than that. There was a lot of debate in the you know, 40s, 50s, and 60s of whether or not players would actually wear this stone ball game equipment that was found. And uh, one would think that it was that it would be, um, you know, for, for a game that required agility and speed and skill, you wouldn't necessarily want something to wear something made out of stone. So maybe what they were actually wearing was something that was made out of wood or perhaps wicker or animal hide or cotton or something like that. Um, I will say that when I when I worked at um, at Yale, we we had one that was determined to be uh, modern forgery, so inauthentic. And um, when nobody was paying attention, I went into the um, into the store and when I actually tried it on, and uh, I was actually it, it was kind of tight going around my waist, but uh, um, I, I it, it sort of sits at your center of gravity, so so I could actually move around wearing it fairly well, um, at least before I was told to to, to put it down. Um, but anyway. Uh, one thing is certain, these yokes never really show signs of chipping or abrasion or, or even really much breakage that you would think that a piece of sports equipment would, would have. So these are probably basically just like stone 
versions of things that people would actually wear. Why they're so often replicated in stone, we don't really know. Next slide, please. Uh, carving varies. So as I mentioned, the, the toad is most often, but they're, they're often decorated in this sort of stylized Gulf Coast styles with, um, with heads and of humans and different animals on them. And uh, yokes can, there's, there's miniature ones that have been found. Most, most are about the size a human would wear. And uh, some of them are plain, undecorated. And uh, others, are, while most of them are U-shaped, some of them are actually closed on one end as well. Uh, so there's a little bit of variety and, and they're most often made of um, like uh, hard green stone or uh, volcanic stone, some, something really durable. Uh, so uh, while mostly it's stone yokes that survive, um, there, there was once found some evidence of a wooden one that somebody would have worn. And uh, ba basically at the city of Tikal, uh, skilled archaeologists noticed that um, they came across a cavity that was lined on the interior with stucco. So what they did is they, they pumped it full of plaster and then excavated around it. And it turned out it was the shape of, a, of one of these yokes that was covered over with stucco. So, um, and it was probably originally made of wood. So um, th these things would actually survive in a, in a variety of media. From a all court panel from the city of El Tajin that shows a, a yoke being, wear, or sorry, a uh, palma being worn on the front of the yoke. And then on the back, uh, there's either a trophy head or an acha uh, fixed to that part. So maybe these forms of equipment could even be worn together. Um, next slide, please. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, yokes and achas and palmas are occasionally, um, they occasionally turn up as, as people dig into the lower depths of structures or sometimes, uh, so they were used as dedicatory offerings, maybe sometimes in burials as well. So this is uh, uh, um, an offering that was found in the city of Xochicalco in the state of Morelos about, uh, I don't know, about an hour south of Mexico City by car, uh, where they found two plain uncarved yokes and a full round acha along with a panel that, that contains some glyphs that, that we're not able to read. And I, I, think, uh, I think the ball bounces back to Angel at this point. Thank you, Andrew. That was excellent, an excellent overview of the ball game. Well, this is the time when we touch the, the danger, the problematic um, outcome for the ball game because uh, when the, the game develop, it turned out to the sacrifice of the probably losing team. And when I'm saying probably, that means that we are not sure for sure that, that the losers were um, killed or sacrificed in this, this way. But it seems like contradictory to sacrifice the, the winner team, right? Because who wants to, <laughs> to have the, the the to preserve the loser team so we are going to pre present artistic depictions of this this uh, activity this human activity can some i'm going to present some human remains um, from recent excavations in central mexico in tenochtitlan in downtown mexico city but first we're gonna display i'm gonna show you certain scenes from El Tajin in Veracruz. This is the ball game court, you know, but usually in this city, there are some artistic depictions, some panels, car, beautiful cards with uh, complex scenes, but depicting this, this outcome. What, hap what happened after the game? Well, what happened was the sacrifice for of one of these um, ball game players that uh, this scene can be for some of you can be um, spaghetti but uh, we're, I'm going to explain to you where we are here in the ball game we're seeing the scene in front frontally so you have two structures here and here we have uh, four human beings, one here, the sacrificer, the victim, and two other uh, human beings surrounded the scene. But uh, a fifth one, a supernatural being probably, is descending from the sky. So uh, you can see that this guy is holding um, 
a knife, shirt probably, and it's, it's, it's sacrificing, it's, it's cutting the chest of the victim probably to, to have the, in order to have the human heart to feed this, this supernatural being. But you can see also the equipment of the, the ball game player, the joke, the axe, the acha and palma. But um, not only uh, we have artistic depiction, depictions of, for this behavior, we are moving right now to late post-classic times, a few decades before the arrival of the Spaniards in Tenochtitlan, present day Mexico City downtown. And in this slide, I'm presenting you some recent excavations, discoveries, just behind the main cathedral. This is the remain of the, the ball game court. You have to keep in mind that it's kind of difficult to, to, to have um, uh, archeological uh, explorations in the city because there are different buildings on top of the pre-contact uh, remains. We have the colonial uh, remains, the, the, the independent time from the independence from the uh, revolution and the modern city that is 20, 22 million people living in this space is kind of complicated, but we, uh, the archeologists, have some um, small spots to, to figure out what, what is underneath the earth. So some archeologist discoveries uh, like five, seven years ago, the part of the ball game court. But the most interesting for us is that they discovered human remains associated with to this stair. So, what we are seeing here, it's kind of difficult, but we have a, a different model uh, associated to this building. Now, this is the, the, probably this is the original form of the ball game court uh, from the Mexica, the Aztec times. So we, what uh, we are seeing is this part, you know, you have the, the, the court here, but the archeologists found uh, the remains of some cervicals of uh, 32 human beings, presumably, or they are assuming that were sacrificed. So the outcome for the, of this sport um, in, in many instances were the decapitation of the victims, several victims, but not only, but different ones. But also if we move to other part of Mesoamerica, in Yucatan, present day in Yucatan, in Chichen Itza, in Veracruz, or in Guatemala, we are gonna see similar artistic depictions, similar um, behavior, human behavior. That is, you can see here, uh, a player, ball game player. This is the knee, this is the other knee, but it's beheaded. And several serpents are coming out from the neck. But these supernatural snakes uh, probably represent are representing blood that also we have in the Aparicio uh, um, Stila from Veracruz. It's a similar depiction. You, know? you can see this uh, human behavior in different parts, in different times of Mesoamerica, but also in Guatemala, present day Guatemala. It's, uh, pretty, it's consistent, the iconography is consistent among Mesoamerica. Returning to uh, Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital. Now, this is um, very shocking for some people. Uh, it's, it's a slight kind of problematic, but it's, it's, it's happening. You know? And these discoveries are changing our understanding of this uh, behavior associated to the ball game because uh, in an archaeologist this just discovered hundreds of uh, hundreds of human skulls forming um, a tower um, attached to uh, pl uh, plastic uh, pl uh, plaster i mean um, stucco you no know? you can see here uh, different views of this building it's called the Tzompantli in Nahuatl in the Aztec language you no know? you can see the only human heads. So that, that tell us 
that the outcome of, for this sport probably was the death of the losers. But also in other materials, in other media, we have similar depictions, not only human remains, but in ceramic. This uh, piece from the, from the Justin Kerr collection, the beautiful uh, ceramic uh, vessel presenting two scenes, but with similar iconography. Uh, ball game players, this is the ball game, the rubber ball. But this guy is speaking. You can see here the speech scroll, but it's holding a human head, grasping, and blood is coming out from, from the neck. So as we see in, in from the Veracruz Stila, but also in, in other materials in basalt, this beautiful scene, delicate carving, uh, showing us a similar scene, um, the sacrifice of the victim with a uh, knife and uh, supernatural being, uh, probably a bat, is feeding with blood and human hearts. But another important part of this building was the the ring. You now, where it uh, it has uh, always a, a, a hole when the players try to hit with the ball and to cross the, the this part with the, the rubber ball, but it's um, kind of odd that in from Tenochtitlan, one of the most power capitals in Mesoamerica, we don't have uh, this kind of rings. This, this was the, these pieces were the focus of attention for the entire population when the game was happening. But in Tenochtitlan, we don't have many of these. That's kind of odd. But we have other examples and other pieces from different museums and collections in the world. So, uh, and we're seeing in this scenes carved in these rings, similar behavior. The Aedes in this case can be um, Mishkoatl, one of the, the hunting gods, grasping a uh, human, human head, you know, dancing probably. But other times, the sun, you can see this, this kind of green, it's representing the sun, is, is present here. So the idea, the logic here is the dead of the sun, the rebirth of this uh, star promoting uh, agricultural fertility. And, but also in a recent, recent uh, research made of uh, Leobardo Alvarez, a Mexican scholar, he showed that one of these rings placed in the ball court uh, building were reused for other kind of um, rituals, behaviors, like um, ritual uh, gladiatorial um, fightings that we can see in this uh, colonial uh, codice manuscripts from Diego Duran. So we are seeing a similar ring, but reused in a different way. This is called in uh, Nahuatl, the Aztec language, Temalacatl. You know? So the idea is that uh, a captive was tied to this stone with a rope, and the victim uh, had to fight with different warriors, fully armed. But uh, the end was always the same, the sacrifice of the victim. But also we have a, a iconographic parallels with a very famous piece from the Aztec times, the sunstone of the, or the calendar stone, you know, when the sun is coming out from the underworld. And I think it's time for Andrew. Hey, uh, thanks Angel. So I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sort of what the ball court itself represents as a piece of uh, civic architecture and sort of what it, what it sort of um, symbolically represents as a, as a whole in the Mesoamerican cosmos. So uh, as Angel mentioned earlier, uh, a major focus of the symbolic um, 
attributes of, of the ball game seems to have been the movement of the sun. So that, uh, you know, whether maybe sinking of the ball into the into the ring means something like an eclipse or something like that, or, or maybe maybe specifically periodic games were played for ritual purposes that involved sacrifice, maybe at certain times like uh, equinox or solstice or something like that. But nonetheless, um, a lot of it's a little bit hypothetical, but backed up by evidence like what Angel just showed of these ball court rings that have solar imagery on them. And uh, while not every ball court has a ring, uh, a lot of them have markers on them. And um, a couple of examples I'm going to show really do reflect solar imagery. So um, Xochicalco, the, the site that I mentioned in the state of Morelos that has where that uh, that cache with the two uh, undecorated yokes and the, and the acha came from, uh, has uh, one of the objects that was found there near the ball, near the south ball court, the city has six ball courts, um, was this um, really large macaw head in the upper right that looks just like an acha, it looks just like one of these stone stone uh, uh, ball game ornaments, but it's really big. It's probably, I would, I would say maybe about two and a half, three feet tall, but clearly made to, to resemble an acha, uh, sort of like the smaller ones that could possibly be achas from the same site down below. Interestingly, um, what this really resembles is uh, ball court markers from the, the Maya city of Copan, which is uh, almost about as far away as you could get from Xochicalco. So this Copan was a city, major city, but way at the far eastern end of the Maya region. So almost like sort of a frontier zone at the edge of the Maya world, uh, whereas Xochicalco is right in the middle of central Mexico. But uh, its its main ball court was, was decorated with several different phases of um, macaw head markers. And the macaw is uh, sort of an inherently a solar bird uh, because it's, it's, um, it's, its red and blue feathers are often um, compared to the, to the rays of the sun. And, and the, the sun is sometimes even visualized as a, as a macaw that moves through the sky. Uh, next, next slide, please. Here's one of these um, ball court markers in the shape of a macaw head at Copan that's been basically reset where it probably would have been originally. Um, uh, next slide, please. And uh, to the right, uh, what you see is a reconstruction of a, a giant stone, uh, sorry, stucco macaw that was once situated right above the, uh, on sort of like the, um, a, a temple that was right above the ball court. So uh, it, it's really colossal. It's, it's uh, um, I, I don't have exact dimensions for you, but I'm, I'm guessing it's, it's probably about 10 feet across from the tip of the wing to the tip of the wing. Painted red and white, it's, uh, it's, it's no ordinary macaw. It's wearing a, a, like a jade necklace around its neck. It's got these um, wings that have giant serpent heads basically the, the, the wings are the form of giant serpent heads. And then on top of the wings, there's four additional smaller macaw heads. So it's, it's basically like a big macaw with several small macaw heads coming off of it. And the, this being actually shows up in other cultures in Mesoamerica. So to the left, um, it's very hard to see, but this is a decorated column, detail of a decorated column from El Tajin, Veracruz, where it's a figure wearing that same macaw outfit. Um, you can see the macaw head with a human face peeking out. It's got outstretched wings, and then there's smaller macaw heads on those wings. So it's probably the same being that we we know to relate to uh, the sun. And uh, if you're familiar with the um, the colonial period Maya epic, the Popol Vuh, who this really recalls is uh, is the um, a, an entity called Vukub Kakish or Seven Maka is the is the um, is the being's name. And Seven Maka is not the actual sun, but he's 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 this sort of resplendent bird that's got jewels for teeth, and he's he's boasting as if he's the sun, and the hero twins come and and use a dart, dart or sorry, use a blowgun to knock out his jeweled teeth and kind of take him down several notches. So, um, and, and and this being seven macaw is actually related to another uh, being that sometimes takes the form of a macaw called Xochipili um, or seven flower, who is um, basically a, um, a central Mexican god of um, music and dance, but also games and gambling and things like that. So it's it's pretty consistent symbolism through, with these uh, with macaws and and uh, the ball game and the sun. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the the ball court was really, um, as I mentioned before, a, a really critical piece of civic architecture. Sometimes there were there was one ball court in the city. Sometimes there were many. Uh, some there's some pretty small ones. Classic period Maya sites have pretty small ball courts that seem to have only maybe been able to accommodate 
two to four players, but then at Chichen Itza, the, you'd see the largest ball court in, in all of Mesoamerica that easily could have accommodated maybe teams of six players each or something like that. Um, this is actually uh, a, the, um, a, a panel from the a stairway of a Maya temple from the city of Yaschilan that shows a ruler as a ball player about to strike a ball and inside the ball is a bound captive. Um, and rather than in a court, uh, what you see there is the steps of a temple. And again, this 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 monument actually was the step of a temple and it was was on a temple that wasn't necessarily close to a ball court. But uh, interestingly enough, the Maya often sort of complete, conflate temple and ball court together as as one as one single unit. So it's almost like a, it almost it almost doesn't really refer to actual architecture unless they did maybe play against the steps of temples sometimes. It seems like it's more like they're referring to simultaneously the space, the ball court and the temple. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is clear outside of the Maya region as well. So this is a big stone boulder that was car uh, found at Xochicalco, um, the site that I've mentioned a couple of times in Morelos, that shows um, that the, the top pointed part is a, is a temple and you can see steps coming down the front faintly. And then right next to it is a is a is one of these capital letter I-shaped ball courts that's carved as a depression. Uh, next slide. And uh, you can you can see it here maybe a little bit better on this uh, um, and this uh, um, view that uh, um, basically um, a, a friend of mine stitched together using a, a computer program, Eric Heller. So uh, what you see on the right is the temple and down below it is the I-shaped ball court. And notice that the temple also has all these little pock marks in it. And the whole thing really sort of, almost sort of begs to be, to have water or other liquid poured over it to, to collect in these different um, channels and, and, uh, and cupules. So um, presumably you could you could pour uh, water or other liquid over the top of the temple and it would flow down into the ball court. Um, uh, next slide, please. And interestingly, although there are six ball courts in the area of Xochicalco, that particular arrangement of ball court right next to temple doesn't really appear at the site. So it's that 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 um, stone boulder that I just showed was was. Um, sort of an idealized representation rather than one that's reflected in our actual architecture at the city. Next slide, please. Uh, so that was an impressive carved boulder, but at the city of San Miguel Ixtapan in, in the Estado de Mexico, kind of like in the Southern part near the state of Guerrero, in the city, there's a, a large uh, rock outcropping that's, that's completely carved with temples and ball courts and, and other structures. And this, this is just a part of it that I'm showing here, but you can this gives you an idea of sort of the topography of it that's just sort of carved on all surfaces with steps of temples and, and shrines and things like that. Uh, next slide, please. I've highlighted here uh, five of the ball courts that show up in this, in this uh, rock outcropping. And at the city itself, um, the city itself doesn't really look like this, and I believe there's only one ball court there. So um, presumably this, this was a site of ritual right here where, where you know, people could do some sort of, um, you know, pouring of liquid or possibly even uh, making sacrifices where the liquid that, that comes out of that would be, you know, collected in these little, little pools. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, relationship between, so if, if, if we can take for a moment the idea that a, a pyramid is sort of a symbolic human-made mountain, uh, really, the 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 model of the central Mexican city is is uh, comes from the Nahuatl term Altepetl, which basically means water mountain, and it's graphically shown oftentimes as a as a city. A city will be shown as a as a mountain with water gushing out from beneath it. So, really, um, the, the essential parts of a city in central Mexico is the the the, the temple as or sorry, the temple as mountain and the water source. So this is kind of how they encapsulate urban space is comparing it to Altepetl, the water mountain. Next slide, please. Here, here's another representation from the colonial period that shows a, a mountain with, with uh, water pouring out beneath it. So this is, this is again, sort of like meant to represent urban space, not necessarily a, a wild space, but showing those, those two essential features of a city, water and, and temples, basically. Next slide, please. This is a Maya vessel 
but it, it also shows the relationship of the ball court to water. So um, our mutual advisor, Carl Tauba, has done some work in this recent, recently showing the role of the ball game in, in water ritual, not just solar ritual. So this is, uh, this is a ceramic vessel. You could, you could pour some sort of liquid into the spout there, but it's not, nothing, I think it would be very difficult to drink out of this vessel. And as, as the vessel pours through the spout, there's um, small holes within the sort of the I-shaped depression that makes the ball court's playing surface that would actually fill up with liquid. So not really clear what this vessel would have been used for, but you could, you could possibly even imagine that it was, you know, some sort of um, maybe even the device for pro prognostication or fortune telling or something like that, or maybe for, for contacting spirits as, as Angel mentioned, and I'll show, elaborate on it a little bit, the ball court is also a sort of a space of contacting spirits from the underworld mostly. Next slide, please. So whereas for the for central Mexico, Altepet, the, the water mountain is the model of the city, for the Maya, for the Maya, it's chen and wheats, which means cave and mountain. So very similar symbolism for, for Maya as to how they conceived of their cities, but basically instead of a instead of a, a well or a source of water, it's a cave. But in much of the much of the Maya region, you don't have to dig down far to get to the water table. And in fact, in Yucatan, the only sources of water available are are down uh, if, if you dig into the earth or, or um, when a natural sinkhole appears. So Angel mentioned this before, but uh, this uh, quatrefoil shape um, it is widely shown as a cave entrance in Mesoamerica. So to the upper right, this is uh, probably was once the entrance of a, of a ritual cave um, that takes the form of a um, sort of a big earth monster. And the, uh, the opening of the cave is this quatrefoil shape. Um, gosh, how many thousands of years later? Maybe 3,000 years later? 1500, um, we'll go with that. A uh, colonial period uh, image from central Mexico shows a very similar type of image of a mountain with a with a, sort of a zoomorphic mountain with a cave mouth uh, beneath it. And then uh, over on the left, this is a ball court marker from the ball court I showed earlier at Copan. It shows, um, shows somebody playing ball against an underworld deity and it's all framed within this quatrefoil shape, which um, suggests a, a mouth to the underworld. So this ball court marker would have actually sat flat on the surface of the, the playing court and, and was sort of conceptually an opening into the underworld. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, these, these uh, round ball court markers, so that, that's an actual one over on the left, a really exquisite example from a place called um, uh, Chincoltique in, in southern Chiapas. They're about the size and scale of, um, so, so the Maya would, would often dig into the earth a, a, a chamber called the Chultun, uh, which was used for storage and sometimes was used for storing water as well, usually for dry goods and sometimes burials, but, uh, but often for, for water as well. And these ball court markers are roughly about the size and shape of a, a Chultun cover. So um, suggesting as well that the, the, the space of the ball court is sort of a symbolic well or source of water. Uh, next slide, please. And we, we see this somewhat uh, among um, Aztecs and, and, and their um, early colonial uh, images that were made by, by the descendants of the uh, um, inhabitants of the Aztec empire. So here, uh, here's a ball court from a, a document called the Codex Malia Becchiano that shows um, skulls at these four corners of the playing court, but also along the center line, there's, there's three skulls that are a little bit different because they've got this distinct ruff of hair that, that goes on top of them. And then of course, on uh, flanking either side of that row of three skulls are the two ball court rings that, um, that the players are trying to shoot the ball through. Um, next slide, please. Here's another similar image from the Codex Borbonicus made shortly after the, the arrival of the Spanish, uh, which shows a, a, the ball court with a skull in the center and with um, possibly a, a ball, a black ball or a hole um, right by the skull and water is shooting out to the left. So, so this again shows the relationship of, the, the, of water to the ball court as a sort of a symbolic well. And in fact, um, I, I, I remember reading at some point that um, some acoustic um, explorations of the space where they believed the ball court was in, in Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, um, that, that space seems to have actually been built on a water source as well. So again, sort of um, um, emphasizing the fact that the, the ball court is sort of a, a well in and of itself. And, and many ball courts actually have drains on them, which show that they could be um, cleared of water, but also filled with water as well. Um, next slide, please. 
And uh, um, Angel showed bits of these images before from uh, the sacrifice at El Tajin. So the, the, the center of the ball court being this sort of sacrificial space where um, on certain occasions, ball players or, or other people might be sacrificed. Um, um, the, the, the drawing from Chichen Itza to the, to the bottom, again, shows this um, kneeling decapitated ball player on the right, who's um, from, from, his, from his or her neck, uh, blood in the form of serpents is spraying out and, and, and a big vine is growing out of there as well. There's a ball player over on the left that's um, wearing a, a yoke and a palma and holding a knife, and in the other hand, holding a severed head, which is undoubtedly the head of the, the figure over on the right. Down at the lower center, there's a, a round object with a skull in the middle that has a very similar ruff of hair to the, to the one I showed earlier on, on that uh, colonial period uh, manuscript. Um, it, it's sort of been hypothesized that, um, that that's the ball and that um, sometimes Maya would put a human skull at the center of the ball. I've, I've always doubted this a little bit. And, uh, something that strikes me about this image is the big, what looks like big drops of water coming off of the side of the of the the putative ball there. And I wonder if this is actually um, a ball court marker rather than a ball that shows a skull and 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 water dripping off to the side of it. So that's that's a that's a that's a theory, but uh, may not be true. But um, at either rate, I think this um, image does show sort of a clear um, connection between. Um, sacrifice, decapitation, ball game, and um, water, and then like the outcome of that, which is like agricultural fertility and sprouting vines and things like that. Um, next slide, please. And so, so just to recap again, here's, here's these images all together. Um, lower left, the Codex Borbonicus with the water spurting out of the side of the skull there at the center line of the court. Uh, up above that, the Codex Malibecchiano that shows the uh, three skulls with that ruff of hair on top, um, marking the center line. And then the lower right at Chichen Itza showing this object with a very similar skull in the, in the center of it, which is probably a center line marker, if you ask me. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's where, that's where we'll leave it off and turn it over to questions. Um, I will be moderating the questions, so I'll get right to it. Um... We got a question from Erica. Has it been identified how many players are participating for each team or group? Whoever wants to answer. I think it's not an homogeneous number. I think there's many variations among uh, space and time, but artistic depictions are showing teams of two or three members each. You know? but as I mentioned, there is a big, big uh, difference in numbers uh, among time and places. Yeah, these um, Maya depictions, um, like the one I showed that showed the ruler of Tony Nan, Kalak Mool, it's kind of like one-on-one -on -one sometimes. And, and I think ball court size would also determine that somewhat. somewhat. I mentioned that classic Maya ball courts are often very small and, and, and then early post-classic Chichen Itza is really large. And, those ball court panels that show sacrifice show like, um, I don't know, like five or six people lined up, I think. So presumably that was a game where they could accommodate a lot of different players. I, I think something that's also important to note is that, you know, this is a multifunctional space and there were probably a lot of different types of ball games and other types of games and, and performances and all sorts of things that happened in that space as well. Yeah, Andrew, it's a very good point that we usually think that these buildings were used for only one purposes, but I think uh, archaeological evidence, epigraphic and iconographic shows that there are many, it's many different uh, meanings and activities happening at the time. I, I like to think in people acting like today as in modern stadiums, you now shouting and screaming and yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. And actually that, that first rollout base that you showed illustrates that really well. You see the two players, but also this, um, you can see like steps or something behind where there's people at different um, levels sort of talking and you can see speech scrolls coming out as if they're shouting or something like that. So it really sort of like uh, enlivens the our, our vision of the game rather than showing us this sort of solemn um, like ritual or something like that. I, I think there was probably a lot of different types of games that were played there. It's a good point because not all, always uh, we found um, ball courts in the ceremonial precincts, but also in other neighborhoods. 
in Tenochtitlan, for example, like 20 years ago, archaeologists discovered this court in the periphery of the city, almost in, at the end of, of the, the settlement. That is common, common people playing. It's, it was a game. No? It's like for community, for people enjoying. Yeah. It's a sport. Yeah. Fact. Yeah. And that, that sort of um, myth that people always mention about the, the, the winner being decapitated, I, the, basically to get to the origin of that, I think people have pulled that out of the Popol Vuh in which the basically like the heroes of the book are ball players and they, they get decapitated and they come back to life. But um, it's, it's just so nonsensical that the winner of a game would be decapitated because there's absolutely no incentive to do your best and you would really sort of drain the pool of great players pretty pretty quickly. These sacrifice events, I think I think what, what happens a lot with um, with the Maya, we know from these panels that have text with them is that, you know, um, two Maya cities will go to war, they they capture the ruler of one city, they the two rulers play ball together, maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, but it's recorded on a monument. But uh, inevitably, the ruler, the, the victorious city, the ruler of the victorious city beats the ruler of the losing city at the game. So it's, it's kind of this sort of like, um, metaphorical warfare that's probably if there was an actual game i'm sure the odds were heavily stacked against the loser but it's but it's um that, that's the type of event where you might see a sacrifice at the end but i don't think that just your your average everyday game necessarily had to end with somebody being decapitated that's that's no fun okay and i have two questions that are uh, kind of similar uh, one is from Leslie. Did people volunteer to be ball game players, or were they slaves with no choice, or something else? And Sherry asked something along those lines. Did they? Uh, how were players recruited, and did they have a choice with death being the outcome? Um, I think I'm going to take the first uh, time here. I think it's a combination because always um, we have to think in this this logic of to be a good play, ball game player means acquiring status, fame, wealthness, you know, being recognized by the population, by the rulers, having some extra privileges. But in order to do that, you have to pick from the entire population, not always from the elite group, but also from other parts of the city, the settlements. To me, I like to think that the most skilled people were picked up from, from to play these games. Ah, you are good for, for the game. Come come here. You know? I'm going to pay you probably. I'm going to give you some cacao or quetzal feathers if you, you win this, this, this game. I think it's a, it's a combination of um, to recruit the most skilled people, but also I think uh, I like to think that there are some, there were some traditions to play this game. Families dedicated entirely, but it's kind of partly hypothetical. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, those are good points. Um, so um, one thing we didn't really touch on is is uh, at least among the Aztecs, what we know from colonial sources is is um, how important gambling was around the ball game, right, Angel? And uh, you know it, the sources kind of tell us about people gaining and losing their fortunes based on gambling over the outcomes of games. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, there was an article that was written by John Clark uh, maybe ten or fifteen years ago, and he suggested that um, the ball game was actually the original source of wealth difference in Mesoamerica. The ball game among the Olmec, which is kind of an interesting idea that basically like gambling about the game was how some people became really rich and powerful and other people didn't. I, I don't know if I necessarily uh, believe the argument, but you know, it's it's arguments like this that keep our field really interesting and 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 vibrant, keep keep the field moving in interesting directions. Um, one thing I would say about players being chosen is um, uh, of course, you know, it's it's going, going this is going to differ over the the, the vast um, you know three thousand year history of the game and and um, from place to place, but um, one thing that you see at Chichen Itza that that Mary Miller has written about is that on those panels that show the ball player being decapitated with the serpents coming out, all of the other players, the ones doing the sacrifice and even the ones sacrificed, are dressed as as Toltec warriors. So she's kind of argued that. Um, 
that that maybe even the ball game was was sort of a sort of a military training aspect that that uh, that would that was one way to stay in shape when you weren't going to battle or something like that. It's a good point, uh, but also there is another myth from the Aztec times, telling us the story about the king of Tula, ah uh, yeah, the yeah. Toltec city, no, but at one point the king Wemac was playing with the uh, rain deities, the Tlaloque, no, so it turned out that. The King Wemac won the game. And the Tlaloque, the losers, were like, okay, we lose, but um, we are going to offer you corn. But King Wemac said, I don't want your corn. I, I, I like your jade um, attires and your quetzal feathers. So the Tlaloque were all so offended. It's like, okay, you don't want my corn? Fine. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna give you rain for many years. So it turns out that the, the fall of the city of Tula. But that it's, this story gave us an, an, a sense of what, the importance and of gambling and the importance of corn, of course. Yeah, and it tells us that you know at least in in the story, a uh, uh, king was the ball player as well, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really good example. Okay, we also got a question. Uh, you mentioned that the players were men, but could also have been women. Were spectators also segregated by gender, or is there evidence of a mixed crowd of men, women, and possibly children, like a community event? It's a very good question, because in our scientific tradition, it's a kind of problematic topic to touch. And the, the argument is no, they were segregated. But actually it's not totally true. There are some evidences that, for example, in just Chilean, women were, were at the ball game. Um, among the Aztec times, we have the, this book, the Codex Borbonicus, where the ladies are in the ball game court, but one of the participants is women. So then we, we have to reevaluate these assumptions that only men were allowed to play the game. Yeah, we always, as archeologists, we always have to be careful not to supply our own, we have to get to the surface of our own biases and, and, and be careful about not, um, not like, you know, imposing those on the past. And um, another thing I would mention is that there are a lot of um, early, early figurines. So we're talking about like 1200 BC to 900 BC, particularly mostly from a place called Xochipala in uh, the state of Guerrero, heavily looted and not, not well known archeologically. Um, and then from Tlatilco and right, right in Mexico City that, that pretty clearly seemed to show women wearing uh, gear that you know was very plausibly ball game equipment and not everyday attire or anything like that. So helmets and big padding on the waist, sometimes these big like pads on the hands and things like that, pretty interesting. Okay, thank you. We also got a question from Art Garcia and we'll, we'll answer a couple more questions, maybe two or three more questions just to be mindful of people's time. Um, is it possible that the yokes were worn in play to help deflect the hard rubber ball? Well, um, I, 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 think, I think this brings up a good point. If, if the ball was solid rubber and anywhere near the size that's depicted, or even, even, even say like soccer ball size, you know, most of the balls that we use in sports are hollow animal skins or, or rubber and don't weigh that much. But if, if, a, if a ball was flying, a solid rubber ball was flying at you full speed, I could see it breaking bones or at least pretty seriously knocking the wind out of you. Um, I, I'm still a little hesitant to say that players would have worn stone equipment, but you know they, they could have at some point. Um, but but most certainly, I think you would want some pretty serious form of padding on your, especially on your vital organs. Yeah, I, I think I would like to to share an experience. Last year, I was in Mexico City downtown, so there were some ball game players using this 
rubber ball, like soccer ball. I'm not a soccer player too, no? And the, the, the game was bouncing over there. It's like, hey, you can throw me the ball. And I try to hit it with my leg. It's so heavy. It's like, oh, it's hard. It, it's hurting. So yeah, I can see that I've seen several damages in the actual game. Yeah. Um, so, so where my uh, ball players wear this big giant padding, Aztec players would wear really tight padding that would basically sort of pull your skin tight. So, um, so like your, um, you know, it doesn't slap as hard on your skin, I guess, or something like that. Um, and then, then, uh, yeah, I guess that's 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 the main point on that. And I, I would bring up one more instance from at least from the Popol Vuh anyway. Um, the uh, underworld gods challenge the hero twins to play ball because um, they hear the the hero twins playing ball on the surface of the earth, and it sounds like thunder to them. So I mean, that sort of tells you sort of like the the sound of a heavy ball hitting the court, right? And and how you wouldn't necessarily want that to you know, wouldn't want to stand in the way of that without some serious padding or some some form of, of deflecting it. Yeah, and returning to modern examples in Sinaloa, it's a it's a common game in Sinaloa and in Oaxaca, the la, la pelota mixteca, the mystic ball. So we have reports that several injuries <laughs> play in this game. So be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we'll do maybe two more questions. Uh, the Codex Borbonicus showed the court divided lengthways, while other drawings show contestants at either end of the I-shaped court. Was the game played in both orientations? Mm, archaeologically, we have um, at least two courts from Tenochtitlan, both inside of downtown, in, in, inside of the main precinct. And in the past, we have this idea that the court was aligned north-south, but for both classic times, I think that it's a very permanent behavior to, to place the, the court and following the path of the sun, that is east to west. That is, and, and actually archeologically, we know that, that this is the, the main orientation of the, of uh, late post-classic uh, ball courts. But also we have other um, depictions in for the, the ball game in several several codices, uh, Maglevechiano, well, all the Aztec group, the Borgia group, the uh, Borbonicus, and so on and so on. Okay, and uh, we'll do one more question. Uh, this is from Art Garcia as well, the depiction of the two rulers playing showed them kneeling at center court. Is that part of the overall ritual in that the losing player is shown kneeling at the end of the ceremony? Uh, so the, the panel from Tony Na, right? The um, panel 171. My interpret interpretation of that scene is that it's, it's they're both sort of like, uh, commonly in, in scenes of actual play, players are sort of shown in a falling position, either ready to like strike it with their shoulder or sometimes with, with their hip or something like that. And I, I think these that, that particular scene shows two players kind of going after the ball at the same time. Um, I, I don't know of any, interestingly, there are, there are ritual scenes like the one at El Tajin where the player is about to be sacrificed that show a lot of like post-game activity. And um, there's, uh, I don't know of any Maya examples, but there's another city called Cotzmoguapa in, in Guatemala that was not a Maya city, but uh, um, has a lot of monuments that interestingly enough show people wearing ball game gear, but none of them are actually playing the ball game. They're all dancing, singing. Um, one of them's like holding a human heart up to a sun god that's coming down to receive it. There's, there's all sorts of things like that. Um, that that's what you see in terms of ritual, but I don't know of any sort of a, anything that might indicate like a pregame ritual or anything like that. And I, I, I know I said that was the last question, but uh, I did see a couple of comments, people asking uh, what other resources are good to look up more information on this topic? Well, this, this is the commercial. There is a fantastic book. I think that book 
from uh, it's a catalog from an exhibition um, from the uh, National Museum, I think, or the Mint. It's called uh, the Sport of Life and Death, the Mesoamerican um, ball game, and in the Museum Library, we have an example. This is the first introduction. I think it's a wonderful book um, that gives you a an, an general overview for the, the rules, the games, artistic depictions, um, material evidence. But of course, and there are uh, other sources that we have also in the library, in the museum, North Carolina Museum of Art. Uh, it, the journal is called uh, Arqueología Mexicana, and we have uh, an example of a different uh, ball courts games, um, uh, rubber balls, and iconography. A lot of information is, is there, but I recommend it visit us uh, at the museum. I, I was telling Angel actually before the meeting that that was the second book on Mesoamerican anything I ever bought, and it was just what I needed at the time, uh, just really sort of like great images, very readable chapters that just sort of sparked uh, my imagination and, and what became a, what, what's sort of become like a something I've devoted my life to. So, and, and I got it really, really cheap, so used. So it's, I think it went out of print in probably the, what, like mid nineties or something like that, but it's, um, I'm sure it was a really good exhibition and it's an excellent, ex excellent catalog. Otherwise it's, it's kind of hard to find um, general reader type information on it that's not like horribly inaccurate um and there, there's of course a lot of scholarly literature on it and you know one thing we didn't touch on at all uh is that that the ball game actually exists in the the american southwest as well it's played in a different shaped court but there's there's information on that as well but um a lot of it's not uh not that that readable i would say to a general audience All right, well, I think this concludes our uh, virtual lunchtime lecture. We hope you all enjoyed it. And I want to thank you all again for being patient during the uh, technical difficulties, but we do look forward to having you at our upcoming events and exhibitions. And uh, I will post the recording of this lecture on the NCMA YouTube page and send uh, the link as well uh, via email. Thank you so much, everyone. And, and thank you to Andrew and Angel for this fascinating lecture. Thank you for sharing your insight, uh, your knowledge. Um, yeah, this was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Andrew, always yeah, a thank pleasure. Thanks, Angel and Maria and, and everybody watching. Thank you. Thank Adios. you, everyone. Bye.